Support for Trifles comes from the BSI Press. Manuscripts, collections of papers by international writers, and books covering a wide range of other Sherlockian topics. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And by listeners like you, who choose to support us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the stockbroker clerked, Lady Frances Carfax disappeared, and Bruce Partington planned, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutiae? Have you ever wondered what a commissionaire does? Or what a compositor is? Or of the difference between a stevedore and a stoker? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 324, Premonitions. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, I've got a feeling this is going to be a pretty good show. (laughs) Yeah, I had a vague, yeah, absolutely, something vague suggested that to me. Well, all of our shows are vague, so this is uh, completely in line with that. Oh, yeah. I like that. Absolutely. Well, uh, the good news is uh, we do know which date this show is coming out on. It's out on March 15th, which for you historians and lovers of literature, you will recognize that as the Ides of March. And the Ides of March, of course, meant that, well, somebody had something coming. And um, we know we've got something coming for you in this episode. So stay tuned. Make sure you stick with us because we're going to explore which canonical stories have premonitions in them. Before we do that, though, we do want to remind you that the show notes are available at ihose.co slash trifles324, all lowercase. That'll take you directly to our website, where you can get all kinds of links and sign up to support the show on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. And you can even sign up to get email updates from us so you can rest assured you will be notified when a new episode comes out. And of course, if you happen to be listening to us through whatever podcast app is your favorite, um, just make sure you're signed up to subscribe to us there. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your shows. Well, as I said, Bert, I have a feeling this is going to be a pretty good episode. Um, what do we know about the Ides of March in, well, I guess, just popular culture? Well, popular culture going back to the 17th century, uh, in fact, back farther than that, because if you zip past Shakespeare and go back to um, Petrarch, you'll find uh, poor, poor Julius Caesar in the Ides of March. And the great, now I don't remember the um, the the significance at the time at the the classical significance in the Roman era about the Ides of March, but of course this was um, in Julius Caesar. We learn that Caesar's wife has a premonition that it's, it's all is not well with her husband, and that he should not go to the Senate. And of course he. <laughs> well, he decides to ignore that and goes to the Senate, and we know what happens there. And but I don't remember the classical um, aura or, or the meaning or the inference or anything. Yeah, well, you the, probably do. Yeah, the the Ides of March. Obviously, this happens in the middle of the month on uh, the fifteenth, and it typically uh, coincided with the full moon. And of course, we all know about superstition and the full moon and. Uh, particularly in early societies, how uh, so much was related to the waxing and waning of the moon, the tides, etc., um, even people's behavior. Um, we've we've seen traces of 
uh, people's um, lunacy, literally, uh, activity that is uh, influenced by phases of the moon. So having the Ides of March at the middle of the month and it was coinciding with a, a full moon uh, would make sense that someone would be a little hesitant to send people out, and particularly if one had a dream the night before of some uh, impending danger. So that's kind of where we get it from. And as you say, Julius Caesar uh, in, uh, in Shakespeare's version uh, is where we become the most familiar with it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, of course, throughout Shakespeare, you know, it's a wonderful dramatic thing. Throughout Shakespeare, there are these signs, you know, and these mystic codes that are given to people. You know, you will be successful until, until Borum Wood comes to Dunsinan and... And, of course, the person hearing this says, oh, well, that's never going to happen. It's a forest. Forests don't move around, so I'm in really good shape. But no, no, you know, the author has got other plans for you. Always. They, they always have other plans for you. And, and that is, I, I think, uh, literary 101. If there's some yeah. foreshadowing in a story, yeah. listen to it. <laughs> Somebody yeah, probably but- knows something. Yeah, but that's a good point, too, because in the cases of Sherlock Holmes, Holmes laments at one point that his practice has degenerated into finding lost lead pencils for people. But it's not so. The, the cases that Watson shows us are cases where it takes a lot of effort for people to come and consult Sherlock Holmes generally. I mean, there are some cases, you know, Mary Sutherland, perhaps, aside, where um, people, you know... They, he sort of, he introduces himself early on as the court of last resort, and there are people who are perpetually plagued by worry. They have a sense things are going wrong. The behavior of someone they're close to is is off. They don't get an answer. They're they're lost. There's no one else to talk to. And at that point, you know, they consult Sherlock Holmes. Mm. And you could you could say that pre- premonition. Uh, you know, is is all part of that miasma, that atmosphere. Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm reminded of that classic line from that classic film. Of course, I refer to Blazing Saddles. <laughs> Can't you see that this is the last act of a de- desperate man? <laughs> to which Howard Johnson replied, "I don't care if it's the fourth act of Henry V." <laughs> Bringing us back to Shakespeare once again. So, uh, <laughs> that is a great one. I don't care that it. Back then, of course, Howard Johnson only had one flavor. He had one flavor. It was vanilla. That was it. Yeah. Grew into the rest. Well, um, we are not here to talk about Blazing Saddles or Howard Johnson or even Shakespeare. We're here to talk about Sherlock Holmes. And, you know, as we started to think about premonitions in the canon, we were a little stymied. We were kind of wondering, well, where is there foreshadowing? Where. Uh, are certain aspects of this. And lo and behold, as we began to kind of uh, pluck the feathers on this one, they came fast and furious. And uh, I I think it probably behooves us to state the obvious up front. Um, With a client like uh, Helen Stoner, Mm. who arrived at Baker Street, of course, early one morning, roused Mrs. Hudson from bed, who then turned on Sherlock Holmes, who then turned on Dr. Watson, until everyone was uh, out in the sitting room and consulting with this young woman who was shivering um, out of out of abject fear and terror. And uh, she recounted her twin sister coming to her room uh, in the middle of the night, being disturbed about something. You know, there was just something that was going on in the halls of Stoke Moran that Julia Stoner, uh, who claimed she heard a low whistle and a metal clang, and Helen said, well, of course, you, you're, uh, I'm a heavier sleeper than you, so I didn't hear that. But Julia, they, uh, uh, Watson wrote that Julia's hair began to turn white prematurely because of the levels of anxiety about a certain premonition that she had. Mm. Yeah, that's a wonderful example, of course. And it's interesting because there are cases in the canon where this, these sorts of 
premonitions have the effect. You just mentioned her hair turning white, but there are other cases where this progressively builds up and builds up and builds up, even to the point where it can take someone's life. But it didn't do much at all for <laughs> for Julia, mm. who then finds herself minus a sister, and then finds herself, uh, you know, detecting similar disturbances in her atmosphere. And that's what uh, stimulates her to seek out the ear of Sherlock Holmes. And, and a wise move, too, of uh, Helen Stoner going to, to consult with Mr. Holmes. Um, so that's, that's the speckled man. Um, and w when you said that there are instances of people who are, get progressively more uh, worried, uh, any particular uh, instances, any, maybe any family uh, connections that you have in mind? Yeah, well, there is a, there is a case like that, you know, in, in the Gloria Scott, mm. where um, the, um, the return of someone from a character's past brings a lot of foreboding. And despite every effort, you know, you can't seem to, uh, can't seem to get out of that grip. And it just gets worse and worse. Yeah, and in this case, uh, you can tell that Trevor Sr., you know, of course, Holmes was at uh, the, the Trevor estate uh, recouping from a, um, an injury to his ankle that uh, Trevor Jr.'s bull terrier inflicted upon him. So went out to the country, stayed with the Trevors, and uh, Holmes made some observations uh, just by what he could see and uh, infer and shared it with Trevor Sr., who then fainted dead away, you know, <laughs> face down after dinner right. into the, uh, the, the nutshells on the, on the table. And when he came to, he, you know, he thought Holmes was some kind of uh, wizard to be able to come up with this. And uh, Holmes tells him exactly what he saw. However, he could see that there was something that was worrying Trevor Sr. around all of these observations. And that's what we were then led to... Right try to unravel with Holmes. Right. See, and that's a case where, uh, as you point out, the premonition, the constant drumbeat of anxiety has led a particular character to take certain steps, which then become apparent to Sherlock Holmes, who links all these things together. So it's really just a beautiful example of Holmes's uh, ability to observe and to synthesize and to construct narratives and potential explanations from, from what he sees. Yeah. Well, I, I can think of uh, a couple of others that fall into that exact pattern. Um, let's see if our listeners can't try to come up with those before we come back after this quick word. Well, Bert, I don't know if you've been doing any browsing and sluicing from the BSI press shelves lately, but there is a lot to be gleaned. Uh, we talked over on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere to uh, Phil Burgum, who uh, edited the Haven Horror. And, of course, uh, we've got the, the second volume of Stimulating Medicine. I should say the second volume of Nerve and Knowledge, which is called Stimulating Medicine. Mm. Uh, and we just completed our interview with an author from one of those uh, essays in Stimulating Medicine, Marina Stajic, over on mm. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing that... Today, you know, you can go to websites and so on, like LinkedIn, where you can make deep professional connections. But the fact is that within the world of Sherlockians, the international world of Sherlockians, there are many more opportunities for meaningful professional connections with people who have deep professional experience, but also share your love in Sherlock Holmes. And uh, these sorts of examples, you know, if you're in the market, for a, some toxicological advice. If you want to know uh, about an engineer, if you're interested in an expert in boats and nautical affairs, if you want to talk to somebody about methods of cryptography used in World War II, I could go on and on and on and on, but you'll find these people writing um, and publishing and conversing in, in uh, the Baker Street Journal. Absolutely. And the Baker Street Journal and all the books from the BSI Press are available 
for your reading and purchasing pleasure at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Go ahead and pick up a copy of whatever suits you today. All right, we're back talking about premonitions in the canon. We dropped off uh, talking about Trevor Sr. and, uh, of course, the cryptic message that he received that set him off. There was, uh, I can think of at least two other instances of cryptic messages where the recipients were certainly aware of what they meant and began to worry, um, but everyone else around them was none the wiser for what it is that these messages conveyed, although they could tell that the loved ones in their presence were uh, becoming more and more anxious. Let's let's see yes, if that's... you can name one or two of them, Bert. Well, you know, there's one really good one, but it's a case where the person who received the message was not necessarily becoming more anxious. But it's a great tip, you know, if somebody delivers a cryptic message to somebody in the world or Sherlock Holmes, you can tell... <laughs> that there's nothing good going to come of it. But Sir Henry Baskerville, who receives this message, if you value your life and your reason, stay away from the more. You know, I mean, that is, you know, that's not uh, an advertisement for a new aluminum siding. But no, that's not. But, of course, let's recall that his uncle, Sir Charles yes. Baskerville, knowing full well what the family legend was, uh, was out, you know, outside, down the U Alley, waiting for a rendezvous. And uh, the hound made an appearance. And here, poor Charles uh, fled from the hound. And in the process, he was not harmed by the hound itself. There, was, there were no teeth marks. There was no violence. However, Sir Charles did succumb to a fatal heart attack in trying to outrun the hound, or at least run away from whatever it was that he was fearing. And mm. it could very easily be argued that... This was not a simple um, one-time acute event. That a lifetime of the family curse hanging over him may have worried Sir Charles to a premature death or to, you know, th this particular um, sudden end uh, that otherwise he would not have met had he not had this constantly at the back of his mind. Yes. And you see these sorts of premonitions have fatal ends, too, in cases like the five orange pips, mm. where we wish, some of us wish that Holmes had done a better job protecting the life and interests of John Openshaw, but where there is this drumbeat of strange events, mysterious communications, requests to do something, and things go from, from bad to worse, and inevitably, you know, the hand uh, circles around uh, the neck of the client. And, uh, and uh, it's just wonderful, too, because it's reminiscent, it's so reminiscent of the Gothic atmosphere of, a, of the time mm. and the popularity of Gothic-related stories, you know, where, where something is lurking and affecting someone in one way or another. It really is. And, and what makes it even more... Um, scary in some ways, or at least, uh, at least, um, completely non-understandable from uh, an external person's perspective is the fact that it arrives in the form of these five orange pips, just seeds mm -hmm. that were left in an envelope. Well, that what could that possibly mean, right? It's it's right. something it's something you discard. No big deal. The same thing goes with the child's drawings that Hilton Cubitt comes across right. in uh, The Dancing Men. He thought they were just child's play or right. graffiti. And right. here, Elsie Cubitt was much more concerned <laughs> because she understood the meaning behind them and she could actually decipher the message. Yeah. It's interesting, too, that the Openshaws didn't just take those pips and give them to the gardener and say, <laughs> say, say, Fred, why don't you plant these, uh, you know, down down near the tomatoes yeah. see what happens well, yes well i see my seed of the month club has uh, paid <laughs> off uh, this must be for you fred <laughs> i don't know why it came to me yeah yeah oh my goodness that's that's funny yeah that's funny. but no you're absolutely right about the the drawings from the dancing men talk about a premonition you know this is a fellow who comes to london for a great event and makes the acquaintance of elsie 
And um, it's odd, too, that there's so little communication among this pair about her past and so on. But then he senses something is wrong. Messages appear. He detects a change in her behavior. He consults Sherlock Holmes. There's this mystery laid out. And sadly, he takes the train back home and doesn't come back the next day. Yeah, and another unfortunate oversight. I mean, it's just like um, just like the five orange pips, where where mm-hmm. Holmes has the opportunity to uh, warn a client that there there is some impending danger, and Holmes may not be able to specifically identify what it is, but he is certainly aware that there is dirty work afoot by someone somewhere. So you would think that in those cases where the client has a pretty good premonition, where Holmes has a fairly good idea as to what might befall them, that he wouldn't take extra precautions with them. Mm. It's a shame. Interesting, too, that you know, in cases, for example, like the Red Circle, where uh, it's not really a premonition because you've got characters who are being pursued. I mean, they know that... that uh, it's not, it's not a question about whether or not there's evil after them. There is evil after them. But, um, you know, it's another case where um, the inevitable hand falls eventually. Yeah, and with, with most of these, well, not most of them, with some of them, you have to wonder if they would have been less concerned, less worried, had they been honest with their loved ones from the beginning. If Trevor Sr. had disclosed as that how he made his fortune, or if uh, Elsie could tell Hilton about her scandalous past, or her family's scandalous past, it really wasn't hers as much, um, or the Openshaws. I mean, um, you, you wonder how much assistance or um, even avoidance of these issues they would have gotten uh, had they been more open about them instead of worrying themselves to death or eventually succumbing to exactly what it is they thought they had coming. Mm. But, you know, it's not that aspect of it is not artificial because we find out, particularly as these retrospective biographies are written of certain great 19th and 20, early 20th century couples, you find out that things that were undiscussed, things that were never shared, um, resulted, you know, in in uh, oh, very anxious and bad times for people. So, so to that degree, it really turns out to be quite accurate. Unfortunately, it does indeed. And as it turns out, it is anything but a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. I begin to see dimly what you're driving at. We're only just in time to prevent some subtle 